So welcome to the Treasury Elite Leadership Series. I would like to thank all our viewers and members for supporting this noble cause of Treasury Elite, whose main objective is knowledge sharing, mentoring, and networking. Time and again, we bring in world-class speakers and business leaders across the world in the field of treasury, global financial markets, and entrepreneurship, and conduct various programs, webinars, conferences in different formats. Treasury Elite Entrepreneurship Series is one such format where we learn from industry thought leaders about their experiences of running their businesses, opportunities and challenges they encounter, and broad global trends they see for the future. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Abhishek Goenka, founder of IFA Global and Treasury Elite. We bring in world-class FX, treasury, and financial transformations for companies across India over the last 15 years. And today we have Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, co-founder and MD, Hiranandani Group of Companies. Dr. Hiranandani is the son of Shri Padam, Padam Bhushan, honored ENT specialist, Sri Dr. L.H. Hiranandani. He is a qualified FCA from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, and he completed his doctorate in philosophy, housing revolution in India, challenges and prospects. He is the man responsible for changing the skyline of Mumbai with the delivery of landmark projects, Hiranandani Gardens, Hawaii. The group has delivered, has, group has diversified interest into education, healthcare, hospitality, infrastructure, entertainment, and organized retail since then. Currently, he is spearheads as the national president for Naredco and also appointed as a president of Ashushram. He's an advisor to real estate committee of FIKI, member of RERA Consolation Cell of Maharera, and many other boards like Unitech, NSD, NSDC, et cetera. He's not only the finest real estate developers in the country, but he's socially committed to many philanthropic institutions and initiatives. He's a trustee of 14 colleges, six schools, and the Hyderabad Sindh National Committee Collegiate Board and runs vocational skill development centers. He's a trustee for two hospitals and three temples as a part of his charity initiatives. Good afternoon, Dr. Hiranandani. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation, Abhishek Goenka. Nice to be with you. Glad to have you today as a part of Treasury Elite Entrepreneurship Series. In the next 35 minutes, we would love to learn from your entrepreneur journey. So, sir, my first question to you is, I think one of the common thread which connects a lot of global CEOs and entrepreneurs would be they are just not doing this for the money. I would like to ask you one of the single biggest reason for you to get out of bed every morning and get yourself to work. What is it that drives you today? Well, uh, I think uh, we all go through this process. Uh, initially, <clears throat> it is definitely about money. It's definitely about income. It's definitely about savings. It's definitely about growth per se. All the factors which actually drive you in the beginning of life in your career. And I'm the first generation businessman. So uh, in my family, all were doctors and uh, professionals rather than entrepreneurs as I have been. So it was quite, uh, quite an uphill task to actually get into the issue of the business of business. Uh, today, it's a different story completely because once you have had and achieved a certain minimum level of uh, income uh, and wealth, uh, beyond that, the drivers are quite different. Of course, you have the other extreme example where you have the... Uh, the wealthiest people in the world, for example, and uh, we are very happy and proud of Mr. Mukesh Ambani, who is uh, uh, really a, a tiger in terms of uh, what he's doing and achieving. And we are very proud that we have Indians at that end of the scale. But for the rest of us, really, there is a kind of a temper beyond which it is not really driving for money uh, as a principal factor. And there are other things and satisfactions in life which actually drive you. But to answer your question specifically, the driving uh, force is really to get uh, to another level in life. 
uh, you're constantly endeavored to get to a next level, to improve oneself in order to see that the situation for yourself and the people around you and the core stakeholders is better. And also the fact that uh, you give back to society. So there is a huge giving back which takes place at a certain time and place. Uh, once you are having a certain minimum in life, uh, you start doing that. And of course, uh, I was very fortunate. My father mentored me in order to give back uh, to society pretty early in life. Uh, so we were able to get into, I was able to get into various other activities, which was not for profit. And today, for example, I enjoy that uh, as much as I would enjoy my work and sometimes more into that than the work process. Excellent. Excellent. Niranjanji, uh, I would like to ask that, you know, uh, you belong to a medical family and then you started from textiles, which was a little tricky experience for you initially. Take us through your entrepreneurial journey and some of the important milestones which boosted your confidence and faith. And what are the three important lessons of your life that you would pass on to the next generation of entrepreneurs? I heard your TED talk, which was pretty inspiring. So if you could throw some light on that. I've done three TED talks, so I don't know which one you mean, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, uh, see the point is, uh, uh, I think uh, I saw my father. My father was uh, a very, very eminent doctor, a physician, a surgeon, and uh, was a ENT surgeon of repute. He was a Padma Bhushan, he was a Danvantri Award winner, a fantastic operator and other things. But I did see the fact that uh, he earned a reputation far beyond what a surgeon would get. And that meant that uh, he had a lot of credibility, uh, which was there, easier for a professional to get one than a businessman. But nevertheless, he was outstanding in terms of uh, what he really earned in terms of goodwill, in terms of uh, a position, but in the professional field. When I got into business, one of the things that I did not find was that uh, we were not enjoying that kind of prestige or credibility in the real estate field. We were combined, we were compared with the Dawoods and the Underworld and the Haji Mastans and the Yusuf Patels in my yesterday. And uh, obviously that was a really, a really a shocking thing for me to understand that when we were doing good work in terms of uh, our construction and other activity, uh, the community of developers was not seen as good people. And that was actually quite a shocking thing for me to understand or not understand because uh, I belong to a family with a lot of people who enjoyed that credibility. So one of the things uppermost in my mind has been right from the beginning of the first day is that how can I enjoy the kind of credibility which my father enjoyed in terms of his professional expertise and stuff like that. And also people look up to you in the same fish and manner. And I think that worked for me because then you started following ethical practices, doing good work, good quality work, good commitments to society and people, and really gave more than what they expected from you at the initial instance. So I think all these is one of the factors which is extremely important. The second is, uh, change. And I always, again, give you an example of what uh, Reliance is today as a company. Uh, 35 years ago, uh, when I started my work, uh, Reliance was about textiles. It was only Vimal. And that was what the real mainstay of uh, Reliance was 35 years ago. Look at the number of changes. It went into backward integration, into polyethylene. It went into uh, refining. It went into various other businesses, now telecom, retail, and all these things. So the second thing I realized is that you really have to change yourself in order to the existing businesses and environment and really get into those trades and businesses or in the manner in which new trades and businesses run. So I think that's an important learning lesson for me. And the third was, of course, about the scale of work that we did do. I was never ha happy with the situation of doing very small because I think I enjoyed scale of operations in terms of it. And second, I used to get very disappointed when I used to complete a building. I completed a building in Varsova. I 
and I looked up from one of the balconies of the buildings and everything around me was a sorry state of affairs. The road was bad. Uh, there were no street lights. The sewerage line was not connected. Water lines were bad. Uh, and so everything around me was bad. That's the time when I decided that I needed to make a project where when I looked out of the window of the project, all the other buildings would be and the environment that I created would be mine. So I think a thought process in terms of thinking about a scale which is bigger than yourself at the initial stages and then slowly, hopefully growing into it. So I think all these things really help me in good stead. And I'm sure it will hold a lot of other entrepreneurial people also in good stead. I'm sure. And as you rightly said, uh, when I was listening to this, that, you know, change becomes even more difficult as you attain success, you know, because you try to hold on to your laurels that, you know, whatever has worked for you in the past, you don't want that to lose. So how difficult is that change to happen? I mean, I understand Alliance moved very, very fast in different verticals, but probably a lot of other companies, they stick on to their old business philosophy or old uh, way of doing things or old business and vertical lines, because they're not very sure. When I was talking to one of the promoters, he said, it. what is the concept of core competency? I mean, you know, core competency is nothing. It's all about listening to your customer, understanding what he wants, learn, innovate, and move forward. So what's your thought about, you know, uh, changing uh, and how easy is to change so fast? Well, we all, there's a natural tendency to get into your comfort zone, as you correctly said. Uh, but change is inevitable, irrespective of what we do. Uh, whether you upgrade your product, you upgrade the changes of technology, you try to make products which are far superior to what you made 10 years ago, uh, changes the post-COVID story where a person wants to work from home. All these things will mean changes in the products that you create and the services that you have to deliver to the end customer. Uh, uh, so I don't think there is. We have, of course, the international story of a company called Kodak, uh, which had the first technology patent for digital photography. But because they were so comfortable with the old scheme of chemicals and the factories they had created in order to run the, the, the old uh, photography system that was there, uh, they didn't want to do it. In fact, uh, only when their patents expired that other companies got into it and then Kodak had to actually wind up uh, their operations in terms of the world position. So uh, that's one example. Take the example of Fiat and Ambassador in India. Uh, both these companies were assured, Fiat was assured by Maharashtra government that the taxi would permanently be Fiat. And uh, West Bengal was assured by the West Bengal government. Uh, uh, the Hindustan Motors was assured that the ambassador car would be protected, don't change the technology, don't remove the old workmen, uh, don't bother about it and see what happened to the companies. So I think uh, those changes are going to be inevitable in the past and in the future. Uh, so we have to get into it. And yes, uh, I agree with you, it's difficult. And for a successful company like Kodak or like any other successful company in the world, it's far more difficult than otherwise. Right, right. Agreed. I mean, again, we have seen that happening and I'm sure it's not going to be any different in the future. So, sir, how do you differentiate and keep a balance between entrepreneurship and professional management? And what are the traits in people that you observe when you hire and how do you make a world-class leadership team? It's a question for all the family-based entrepreneurs who have these conflicting issues between entrepreneurship and professional management. Um, I think it's a story of every pro, every family run business. To what extent uh, do you rely on your own family for entrepreneurship? To what extent should you professionalize? Early in the day, we did a lot of professionalizing of the companies that we ran. And uh, there were very few real estate companies which actually took professional people into their ground in order to run the companies. But uh, we did find them to a great advantage for ourselves and we continue to uh, find advantages in getting good professional people to actually help it. Uh, for the purposes of entrepreneurial ideas, I think professionals are equally there, uh, but they may not have the risk appetite uh, in their belly. So that's the challenge. So ideas and thoughts do come from good professionals who can guide you and give you ideas on it, but probably uh, the risk-taking ability of the entrepreneur has to be 
uh, supreme in order to do that. Uh, but ideas definitely come from professionals or individuals both at the same time. But it's up to you to have the chicken to uh, uh, be able to do it or you chicken out of that uh, idea. But uh, yes, uh, the balance will always be difficult to do. But more and more as growth stories are want to be, uh, professionalism has to come into the businesses in order to run good businesses which grow large over a period of time. I think professionalism is there to stay. There's no option really uh, but to do that. Right. And what are the three traits that you look personally? I mean, when, when you typically look at hiring a person? Uh, well, it depends. If your person is heading the division, obviously the traits have to have some entrepreneurial uh, ideas also and also uh, ability to cross understand the subject. So a chartered accountant heading uh, a chartered accountant doing the chartered accountancy work doesn't have to be having uh, a cross disciplinary understanding of the business. But the rest uh, the people who head the organization in terms of the CFO or the others uh, do have to have the entirety of the picture in their mind. It's only when you have the cross understanding of the entire business can they actually participate and give proper decision making. So I think a multidisciplinary idea at the higher level is absolutely essential in order to have a good anybody at any of the top levels of operation. And we certainly will look at that type of uh, uh, qualities in the people when we choose heads of the segment. As far as the departments itself, I think uh, people who are good at the core subjects become much more important and the focus is on that subject and shouldn't get distracted with the overall scheme of things. And they should be focusing on the line of business as uh, every other professional should. So you have to distinguish between uh, uh, finding out and recruiting people at that level as distinguished from people at the next level. Sir, uh, you have created an iconic brand. I mean, I remember when I was young and I used to come to Bombay, the first thing that people took me was to Hiranandani Gardens to go for a go-karting ride. And since then we have grown and this is what I think 20, 25 years back I'm talking about. And now I think, uh, so this brand has stayed People have trusted you with your brand. What is your brand philosophy? And if you have to tell someone or an entrepreneur to create a world-class brand, how would, what would be your thoughts on that? And what is your brand philosophy? I think you've already used the right word. That is trust. So a brand is about trust. People should trust you with their money, with their contracts, with their commitments, with their understanding of working with the company. So all the stakeholders have trust in the brand that the brand will uh, stand by them in terms of good times and bad times. So that's the thing which when a brand really comes with it, either you sign a contract or you buy a house or you do any other thing, that's it. So what is the, even the Tata brand that you talk about? It's only about trust. People believe in the trust of the Tata group and that's where the brand actually comes out and actually proves itself. So you, I think what we try, have tried to do is that the Hiranandani should also have and be able to gain trust of the people. So the trust of the buyer of the apartment, the trust of the people who are equal stakeholders, whether they are lenders, whether they are banks, financial institutions, or uh, contractors, or any other people dealing with the company, know that they're going to be a fair play in the transactions that they do with the company. And I think that is what actually builds the brand. But it has the brand expectations can also uh, hit the roof and uh, actually create problems for you because the expectations become too high and you're not able to take care of it. But uh, on the whole, I think uh, the advantages of being a brand certainly is helpful to you in the long run and the credibility does help in terms of a renewed business or growth of business that really brings about. Sure, sure. So uh, uh, now uh, many developers right now are struggling with loan repayments. The sales have been pretty sluggish for a very long time. I mean, uh, almost like eight to nine years, you know, earlier it was GST, RERA, Demon, and now the pandemic. Now, what are the major reasons that 
some of the developers are still not ready, able to cut down the prices and improve the affordability for the end customers. Is there something which, uh, which is a very big stumbling block for them? So one of the factors is, of course, the ready rector rate. The income tax yes, yes. doesn't allow you to go below the 10%. And the government has, in fact, increased the ready rector rate instead of reducing it. Yes. So that's one of the factors. But the second factor is also the fact that replacement cost has become very high. So if you go to make another building for yourself and you want to buy land and you want to uh, get the new FSI, which is available from the government and other costs and cost of construction and interest costs, it's going to be much higher than what it is today. So the question is uh, not only of the fact that uh, you're selling a product, how are you going to replace uh, yourself in terms of land, in terms of construction, in terms of permission and other things. So those are challenges. However, lots of people have reduced the prices. So it's not that they have not, but uh, those who obviously are able to anchor their brand uh, have not reduced the prices substantially, but they, so many of them have. So I don't see the reduction not taking place, but the expectation of the reduction in price is so high that it's not possible to match people's expectations of whatever it is. Even if you give them, uh, if you did a 90% reduction in price, there would still be people who would be <laughs> unhappy. So I, I, I don't think it's only about cutting the prices, but it's also the fact that uh, land costs, uh, construction costs, other costs are also pretty high. And th those are also challenging to the people. But you will find uh, uh, desperate sellers to, and uh, people who take that opportunity and buy it from desperate uh, uh, sellers but then you have to look at quality and the other things which you want. You don't want to buy a bad quality building uh, from a desperate seller. And I think that's the challenge which also is to be beat in the marketplace. Right, right. Uh, sir, uh, so this is a question I want to ask you. you know, a lot of my clients who are, who are HNIs or promoters, you know, they have a large real estate portfolio. And uh, earlier, a lot of this was invested into commercial real estate, partly into residential real estate. Now, if somebody is having a $50 million say worth of portfolio, and that's something which has been earmarked for real estate and allied products. Now, and his main objective is rental yield and price escalation. How should he divide his exposure into commercial, warehousing, data center, REITs, or you know, residential? in today's time going forward in the next five to 10 years. And, where, and if he has to divide that $50 million into a proportion, how should he typically do that? So I do believe that each of the sectors, if properly invested, have got an opportunity to do. So I do believe that in the long run, you will be very safe and secure with a residential investment because over a period of time, it's easy to liquidate residential as compared to any of the other investments that you're going to do. So, and the suretability and easy uh, saleability is a very important factor in terms of it. Of course, you have to choose the location, you have to choose the brand and quality that is there. So residential becomes the touch point of all investments that have taken place worldwide. It's not only about it. The second is, of course, commercial investment. And commercial in the last five to seven years has extracted the best companies in the world so huge amount of money. Last year, more than $40 billion have been invested in India in uh, commercial real estate in this country. And it's continuing to grow. Even in these bad times, we have a large number of international companies investing into commercial real estate. So obviously, there is a lot of interest still happening into the commercial state. And that's also a good sector. The warehousing, logistics, industrial parks, and data centers are the new lines of business where the demand is exponentially high, but at the same time, the risk profile is higher because they are all new businesses. And obviously the returns are likely to be higher. So when you enter new businesses, uh, they are not the set pattern, the set pattern of demand, the less pattern of setting up, the setting up of people, the number of products that can be sold is limited. And hence uh, all these segments are definitely there. So if you had the money, and I would uh, really recommend that you kind of break up your investments like you would do in the share market in different caps that you have in terms of each of the segments that you do. And over a period of time, depending on 
uh, individuals uh, uh, appetite for risk and uh, long term period that you will really look at but anybody who wants to enter into any of these real estate business should not look at anything less than 3 years so if your client is saying that i want to get into real estate and is talking about making money in the next 6 months uh, please dissuade him from getting into real estate but if he wants to make good money uh, in the next 3 years and is having that patient investment attitude i will i assure you that real estate will be a very good investment target in the segments that you have discussed about so huge opportunity in real estate and the international players are coming uh, heavily into these segments into india of course they pick and choose those are ones where they have feel that the prospects are better but i think the opportunities will continue to grow we are heavily interest Uh, invested into these sectors so if you have to uh, rank them uh, in terms of uh, you know growth because nine years suppose the residential didn't grow it was in a down so it's it's a concept of mean reversion you know when the next cycle comes in probably the initial growth will be very high so if you have to rank them in terms of parity uh, in forms of investment how would you typically rank them in case that's the right answer to question to ask you well uh, the pockets are very different so it actually depends on your appetite so if you want to be a safe player in the long run residential is the way to go if you are looking at uh, uh, long term in terms of return portfolio which you can actually give it away to any of the large investors commercial looks very good and if you are looking at an entrepreneurial outlook these new businesses of warehousing logistics and data center is doing i told you that we are heavily invested into residential into commercial and we are now into the data center industrial and logistics spaces also so we okay. kind of balance our portfolio and are putting money into all but it all depends on your appetite at this point of time and mm. your perceptions of how it will grow uh, we are so heavily invested into the whole gamut of real estate that for us we don't really uh, uh, we think all the areas have a uh, thing but the maturity may be different correct 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 sir uh, i feel uh, success in entrepreneurship does not happen till you know how to be conscious of your thoughts have a crystal clear vision and goal you know being extremely flexible and nimble like a palm tree what are three major learnings of your spiritual journey and how do entrepreneurs you know typically fight emotions of failure regret self doubt comparison etc now this is typical <laughs> issues that companies or people face what are your thoughts on it and if you could cite some examples um uh, happiness satisfaction spiritual satisfaction uh is a thing that works through the mind and it is not about the balance sheet that you have you can be spiritually satisfied emotionally satisfied by having very little and still be happy and satisfied in what you have the issue of commercial success is an external perspective it has nothing to do with you you may be very very successful in 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 this country and you may be the second richest man in india but you are still the second richest man and you may be very unhappy because you are not the first richest man in india so happiness quotient has nothing to do with what your financial success is you may be the richest man in india but you are not the richest man in the world so he instead of being happy mr ambani could become very unhappy because he is not the richest man in the world which he may be one of these days but the question is of uh, satisfaction in terms of the mental quotient the spiritual quotient so a person having very very little can be very very happy and emotionally satisfied a man who has too much can really be hungry and say i am not satisfied because i want to have more or i don't have this in my kitty but uh, that's an involvement of a human being Uh, which has nothing to do with the monetary part of the money part of what it is and uh, so you will even have a, a 
rich people who are constantly complaining about you know not having enough or doing this that even though they may have plenty in their kitty but uh, I, I i i don't think the two match uh, those people who uh, who are only looking at the money quotient can never be happy people in terms of it so you need to make a balance between the financial quotient and the emotional spiritual quotient so to say if that is what uh, you described it as sure sir uh, one fun fact about you what people do not know and uh, please tell us about your fitness routine which changed remarkably at the age of 48 uh, please tell the audience something about it well uh, 48 was a critical year in terms of my health i was overworked uh, maybe underpaid and also <laughs> under uh, my health was not too good and uh, one day i was went to my school campaign and i ran an old boys race and uh, after running 20 meters i was kind of panting <laughs> so it was extremely <laughs> difficult and i suddenly realized that you know life was stupid on my part trying to make my income my make money and at the same time not looking after my health and at that point of time something occurred to me in my head rightly so and my life changed actually so i slowly got into the fitness regime looked after my health joined the gym Uh, started uh, yoga, different activities at different points of time. So we do a fast forward to uh, pre-COVID uh, position. I used to gym uh, three mm. days a week. I did do yoga two days a week, and I ran five kilometers once a week. And of course, I run in the marathon ten kilometers at least twice a year. So all that changed completely in terms of it. So. it this became a mantra which was extremely important to me as the first mantra if you're not in good health all the rest of it is are not important so you have to do it and uh, it's very useful to me today because uh, the body immunity system in the covid times becomes extremely important if you are having a reasonable fitness level or so i think so uh, the point is that uh, i think uh, we all have to learn to remain fit and the fitness is a part of my mantra goal which i try to maintain uh, now of course in the last 150 days i must have exercised at home gym uh, at least 140 days so uh, it's been Excellent. quite a good thing that i've been able to maintain my fitness level or mantra as you may call it yeah and one fun fact about you what people don't know ah uh, i we people don't know i <laughs> uh, some people don't know i would say <laughs> all right in the last 150 days i've learned how to do the jive the ballroom dance of the jive which i never thought that i would do i'm not much of a uh, dancer or a ballroom dancer but i've learned that in the 150 days of the lockdown so that's many pretty interesting i guess since it is in the last 150 days not many people would know about it <laughs> that's pretty interesting that's pretty interesting so i think it was a, a, a wonderful discussion with you sir uh, i love the uh, the content and the journey that you shared and you know some of the thoughts that you put across for entrepreneurs i mean it's so very relevant in this uncertain yuka world and i'm sure they would have taken uh, uh, these relevant points in uh, their stride and would learn from it and take it forward in their businesses thank you so much for your time and uh, it's a pleasure to have you at the treasury elite entrepreneur